So I think we can start now. Everyone seated, everyone in a comfortable position. Uh, welcome to my talk. It's called RAUC, or Behind the Scenes of an Update Framework. It also uh, gives the impression, yeah, that I, we will hear something about uh, how uh, RAUC behaves, um, how we uh, develop the update framework, and some of the internal design decisions um, we did when uh, developing RAUC as an update framework. So my name is Enrico Jörns. A short note about me, I'm an embedded software developer. Come on. So we do it the manual way. Um, I'm an embedded software developer and the co-maintainer of the RAUC update framework. So hopefully I know what I'm going to talk about in the next 35 minutes. And uh, I'm working at Pangotronics since 2014. For those who don't know, Pangotronics it's an embedded Linux consulting company. And uh, yeah, we do uh, embedded consulting and support since 2001 and do a lot of open source work. And uh, during these days, we uh, made over 5,000 patches in the Linux kernel. And, ah, it's this way around. <laughs> so a uh, short introduction, a general uh, description of updating for those who are not that familiar with updating. Um, from the overall perspective, we have an update system, and it looks probably similar to this one. We have somewhere here our build server, where we generate our images, our artifacts that we want to deploy later. Uh, then we pack it into a format that is, uh, yeah, that is for updating, where it's bundled somehow. Uh, we can sign it or should sign it and um, then we upload it into a network, a cloud, or something like this, and then the devices in the field download this update, either by polling or they're notified somehow, and then they install the update on each individual device out in the field. But there's no, not only this, uh, I would say, modern or network approach, but in many uh, scenarios, we also uh, still have this approach. So we haven't a network connection or uh, are in an area where we can't have a network connection or because of security issues. And uh, this is still a valid scenario in many cases to uh, instead use simple USB sticks or SD cards or something like this for updating. And yeah, what we're going to talk about today is mainly about a little about this side, the uh, update artifact generation and signing, and also, and this is the main part, about how to install the update on the target, about fail-safe installation of the update on the target. So uh, what does fail-safe installation mean? So the key to fail-safe installation is atomicity. This means that the update is either fully valid or fully broken, and there's nothing in between. So if someone plugs out the cable accidentally, then the update is either fully operating or it's fully broken. And there's uh, no state in between where I can uh, break, break the device with uh, unplugging a cable or something like this. And uh, short notes on how this works in general is uh, we have a redundancy. Uh, the simplest case is AB redundancy. We have an active system here and an, a B system, an inactive system here that are of equal size. So these are partitions normally of equal size. And we have the bootloader here as the switching point. And when I now uh, start the update the, and running from the a image, the initial thing I do is uh, de deactivating the B slot in the bootloader so that we don't uh, boot it accidentally. Then we write the update to the B slot. And uh, if we have done writing the update and verified the update at the very, very final step, we uh, notify the bootloader to switch to this B partition. 
And this way, we don't end up in a situation uh, where we have an uh, active system that is 50% installed or something like this. So uh, what I'm going to talk today about is mainly uh, image-based updating, because RAUC is an image-based update service. Um, in the past, in I think the past four or five years, um, some update solutions, open source update frameworks came up. Uh, some words to mention are, for example, Mender, RAUC, of course, SW Update, and there are also some more like that, what we have from Android. And uh, on the other hand, there are also update systems that are not using this image-based updating, so they are not replacing the entire file system like OS tree does or uh, like Balena does, which uh, replaces um, Docker images. So let's hear about RAUC, what RAUC is, and what we have RAUC designed for. So um, for those who wonder what RAUC stands for, if it stands for something, yes, it stands for Robust Auto Update Controller, the best name we had those days. <laughs> And yeah, it's basically a, an open source update framework and it uh, was developed by us because we uh, ourselves had many projects in our company where we over and over developed update system based on uh, scripting and specific solutions for each customer, reinvented the wheel every time. And uh, then back in 2015, we decided uh, to develop a framework for this uh, that handles the basic things and that allows us to go beyond this point uh, that you can reach with reinventing the wheel every time with scripting and so on. And uh, nowadays we arrived at RAUC version 1.2 that was released uh, two days before, just before ELCE. And RAUC itself is licensed under the LGPL version 2, which allows, us, uh, allows you to freely use it in your project, also potentially as a library if that's required. And we have a steadily growing community of uh, now uh, about 50 contributors, uh, with, which uh, in total made 1,450 patches. And uh, despite basically RAUC works, of course, uh, there's still ongoing development. Uh, we have to fix things. We have to adapt to new technologies and uh, also add cool new features that are required for new storage, new scenarios, and also like, yeah. So um, one of the most important things are uh, to mention the design goals behind RAUC. So um, the key idea of RAUC was to develop a generic declarative framework uh, which solves many use cases. So um, we saw that there are many use cases are very individual. They depend on uh, the actual uh, board that is used on the storage that is on the board. Um, sometimes you have A, B recovery, but on constraint devices, you need uh, A recovery scenarios or uh, on more, uh, if you want to uh, pay more attention on security than, or on safety, then you have, for example, also A, B recovery. And the idea was to develop a framework that covers all these scenarios, um, but not with scripting, just with uh, configuration. And uh, Instead, we also wanted to limit the complexity. It's complex enough to handle all these cases. So what RAUC focuses on is actually installing uh, images on the target. It's not an update service, not a bootload or something like this. It just limits on installing uh, images in the right way. And one of the initial design goals was also uh, security. So uh, it's mandatory in RAUC uh, to uh, use uh, very assigned images, and uh, RAUC always uh, verifies these images during installation so that you don't have unauthorized initialization on your target. And of course, at, as it has to be fail safe, it also has in general to have a robust design, so we take care for error handling, use shared libraries wherever it's uh, useful to not uh, yeah, reinvent the wheel uh, for every and each functionality. And uh, also, one design decision we made is that we, uh, whenever possible, use um, subprocess calls over library functions, because then we can assure that if, uh, if the update process or something like this crashed, if the writing crashed, um, then we get an exit code from the subprocess that crashed and an error information, but we don't crash our updater itself. And so we can, uh, again, handle it. 
So when you get the code of RAUC, you can compile it, uh, first of all, to a host tool. I have to check out where the laser pointers. Um, as a host tool, and the host tool uh, cares for creating, signing, and inspecting update artifacts. And the other side, when you compile it for the target, then um, you gain a target service and a target tool. So this is the actual interesting part that we now will focus on. This is the part on the target that actually handles the installation. So this is a, a rough overview over the structure of RAUC. So we have uh, this update handler core here that I will describe in the following slides a little, and uh, an interface for the bootloader below, and uh, for the, inter the application or integration with the application, um, as we are a user space library, we have a user space interprocess communication. So we use Dbus for this, and also the command line interface of RAUC itself um, uses Dbus to communicate with the services. Is something worth noting because it uh, yeah, is sometimes unexpected because uh, people change something and uh, expect when they call the command line uh, the command line tool that these changes take effect. No, because the uh, background service is still running and hadn't uh, noticed the changes. So. Um, yeah, as a utility library, we use glib. This is in most modern systems uh, already anyway. And yeah, for uh, installing, for copying, for interacting with the bootloaders, we, uh, as I said before, use subprocess calls instead of libraries. So um, one of the key tasks of RAUC is to have an idea of what the system looks like. So. Uh, how the uh, redundant layout of the system is. So for this, we have um, a configuration in the root file system for AUG that uh, translates these device view, where we have uh, yeah, devices and partitions, to a setup that describes um, slots. So in RAUG, everything that's updatable is a slot. And uh, we transition this to uh, a description of a uh, redundant update scenario. For example, here we have um, two root file systems and uh, two application file systems. And you have here a so-called uh, slot class. So classes describe uh, slots of the same purpose. And we have instances of this class. And this uh, description allows us to set up very flexible scenarios for example, yeah, A, B set up here, but also a recovery or A, B. Yeah, this is actually A, B recovery here. We can also specify uh, bootloader slots that handled outside this scenario. And um, now, this gives us the ability to uh, specify in the update artifact itself not exactly where we want to uh, install the image to, but just for what kind of slot class it is. So, in the update, we can say, OK, we have an image for a root file system, or we have an image for an application file system. And now it's uh, the task of RAUC to uh, find out to which of these slot groups I have defined here uh, the update should be installed. And uh, one key requirement for this is that we have to, first of all, know which is the active slot, because we don't want to override the active slot. And uh, this is when we know that one of these slots is the booted slot, then we know this slot group is the active one. And then uh, we can be sure, okay, we can update our image to the active slot part. Yeah. So this is uh, the key concept behind, behind the slot description and the slot handling in RAUC. And um, to show just shortly, how the slot detection works, there are uh, two basic techniques. Uh, the first of all is that the bootloader explicitly says, OK, I've booted this slot and uh, that slot. So this is done via the kernel command line. And the bootloader just says here, OK, it's uh, the slot for system 0. And uh, the configuration has the matching part where the boot name that it expects from the bootloader when it, it, sec uh, when it selected this exact slot uh, that it gets. 
So uh, whenever it's possible and when you're capable to script this in a bootloader and you, or somehow, then this is a preferred approach. In some scenarios, this is not possible. Uh, we cannot hand this information uh, from the bootloader um, because we can't adapt it or something like this. Then uh, the fallback is uh, that Drauk examines the uh, root equals argument in the kernel command line and tries to match it uh, to one of the slots described in its system configuration. So what this enables us is uh, to also do introspection on the target. So we have this route status command that prints some base information here at the top that I left out. But the interesting part is that you get an overview over the slot, over the uh, redundancy setup of the system. And you also see which are the active slots here currently, which are the act inactive, and also some more like uh, the status from uh, the bootloader and uh, yeah, information which device this actually is and so on. So uh, yeah, th this is what uh, this descriptive uh, view of RAUC enables us to do. And now let's have a short look at the uh, update bundle format. So inside an update bundle, as we call it, there we have the images that you want to install and a manifest file that describes the purpose of each image. So it describes that this root image is for the slot of class root and so on. And um, the bundle itself is a squash file system. We decided for squash file system for two main reasons. The first one is that it is mountable, so you don't have to uh, extract uh, your uh, bundle when it comes, for example, from a USB stick. And the second one is uh, that you gain compression. So normally, um, SquashFS is compressed. And so you don't need to uh, compress the images that are inside. And it also allows to simply append information without being unmountable. So what we do for verification is we app append the signature here and the signature size for uh, finding the start of the signature. But that's just some detail. And um, as a signature, we, we use the uh, CMS format, which is similar to um, what is in SMIME for emails. And uh, yeah, the, the basic encryption uh, method behind RAUC that it uses is X509. So we have the full capabilities of a public key infrastructure if we want. So here's a short view how this actually looks on the targets on the right side. Here we have um, a system configuration where it's, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, on the left side there is the matching bundle manifest. And in this gen generic part here, we specify some base information like a compatible that we also have in the manifest. This is more uh, some kind of sanity checking that we don't install the wrong images for the wrong target. And then we have the curing information where uh, Rauk finds the key ring that it used to verify the bundle to install. And then down here follows uh, the slot setup, the slot configuration, what was shown initially in the picture. So now that Rauk knows where to install, the question is how to install. So how uh, do you actually copy an image to a slot? And uh, we have a technical there, or a handling code there. It's uh, update handlers. So an update handler basically uh, comes from a combination of a slot type we give. So slot type can be X4, UBFS, UBFS, NAND, uh, or FAT. And this is, as you saw before, in the uh, system configuration. And then we have an image type. The image type is uh, derived from the uh, file ending in the bundle. This can be, for example, X4, a tar image, or something like this. And um, based on these two information, um, Rauk has yeah, more or less a matching matrix where it uh, can say, OK, if I have an X4 image and an X4 slot, so how to install that? It's, it's simply a raw copy of this, of, of this image to the actual device. Um, despite Rauk is basically an image update handling, it can also handle tar archives, which are yeah, more or less images no real file system images. But if we have the information that our target slot uh, should be 
this way. Uh, our target should, uh, should be X4. And we know that we have a tar image to install. Then the, uh, the matching update handler knows, OK, I have to call mkfs.x4 on the target, mount, on the target slot, mount this target slot, un, uh, pack the tar image to the slot, and then uh, unmount it again. And this works also for fat petitions with tar and uh, potentially UBFS, where you call MKFS, UBFS, and so on. And this gives uh, some flexibility uh, between uh, what's in the bundle and how it's installed. Yeah. So one other important thing, uh, as you saw in the beginning, uh, for handling redundancy is interacting with the bootloader. So there are two main reasons why to interact with the bootloader. The first of all is um, switching the atomic region on or off, so what you saw in the initial description. So uh, when Raugen starts installing, so actually writing the image, it deactivates the slot it writes to in the bootloader. And when it's done, it uh, reactivates the slot and gives it the highest priority, so that is the next slot to be booted. This is uh, one use case. And the other is mainly for fallback handling that you see down here. It's uh, normally you do fallback handling by uh, the bootloader that you commence a counter. Then you start the system, and then uh, you invoke Raug and say, OK, I've booted successfully at some point. And um, if you boot several times and you don't get this, uh, this reset of the uh, attempts counter, then you probably hit a watchdog or a broken system. And then the uh, boot counter from the bootloader reaches zero sum, uh, at some point and uh, the bootloader switches to, uh, red to the other redundant slot back so that you are still in an operating state. So these are the uh, basic methods we need bootloader interaction for. And we've abstracted it in RAUC in a bootloader interface um, with these basic methods, so mark good, mark bad for activating, deactivating a slot, and um, mark primary, where you say, OK, this is the next slot to be booted. So for example, after an update. And uh, then we have an implement implementation or a matching of this for several bootloaders. At the moment, we support Bearbrooks, U-Boot, Grub, and UEFI. And uh, this handling basically boils down to interfacing with a bootloader with some uh, storage on the bootloader, which is, for example, an environment in Grub or U-Boot or the Bearbox state uh, framework in uh, Bearbox or simply IFIVARS in uh, UEFI. And uh, there's, in each of these bootloaders, either some predefined logic for uh, doing the actual slot selection, or you have to do scripting as it's required for Grub or U-Boot. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically, what Rauk uses is, uh, to interact with it is the um, user space tools provided by the bootloaders. For example, uh, Bearbox State for Bearbox, uh, FWZMF, I think it's called, for U-Boot, or Grubbin for Grub, and so on. So now we, that we know how to install and how to install FaceSafe, uh, we come to authentication. So basically, when you want to install an update from a verified source, you have two options. You either uh, have a trusted transport, like for network, you have TLS, for example, where you can say, OK, the source where it comes from uh, is trusted, or I know that the path to the source is trusted. And the other option is that you have a signed artifact where the artifact is signed, and you have an untrusted channel and perform the uh, verification of the update on the target. And uh, yeah, while this is valid for the network case, if you have, for example, a USB stick update, and this is something we need to support with RAUG, then this is an inappropriate method. So what we do in RAUG, as you have already seen before, is that we do a verification on the target here. So we have uh, signed bundles in RAUG. Um, we use, as a crypto library, OpenSSL 1.x, so mainly 1.1, as 1.0 uh, deprecates, uh, I think, in December. And uh, using the X509 public key infrastructure standard allows us to uh, use everything from a simple self-signed uh, certificate where you have yeah, just basic trust but you can't replace or revoke keys to a full-blown public key infrastructure that I 
uh, where I also have the possibility to uh, revoke keys in our keyring or replace keys when they're uh, after some time or if they got compromised or something like this. Um, together with uh, authentication, I also want to mention some of the uh, signing features. So this is more on the host side of Frog um, as there happens a bundle creation. So what's possible with Frog is, for example, uh, re-signing a bundle. So if you have generated a bundle with a development uh, signature and um, then you tested it over and over and you say, okay, this, is, is, this got through my process and now I want to deploy it on the target um, or in the field uh, without actually changing the bundle, then you can uh, simply replace uh, the development signature with a release signature. Um, this is uh, simply handled by RAUG resign tool and uh, then you can install the bundle with the resign key, uh, with the, um, with the uh, release key on all your devices that are out in the field without touching the content of the bundle anymore. Or what you can also do is placing intermediate certificates in the bundle that you need uh, probably to close the gap between the root CA that is in the uh, curing of your target and uh, the signature that, uh, that was used to sign the bundle. Um, the mechanism also potentially allows to uh, have uh, multiple signers. So if you say, okay, I need a minimum of two signers for a bundle so that uh, the update tool um, accepts it, this is also potentially possible. And what Rauk also has support for is uh, PKCS11. Uh, PK, yes, PKCS11. Um, so you can use an HGSM, for example, a Nitro key, uh, to get the keys for signing the uh, update bundle. And, uh, yeah, further, apart from what you have in the system configuration in RAUC, you also have more customizing uh, things. You can, um, for example, uh, place scripts in the bundle itself that uh, handle some custom installation steps or that uh, do some post or pre-installation operations. This is what we call hooks. So hooks is always in the bundle. Um, but you can also have some uh, predefined handling on the target, some scripts to be executed as post-installation, pre-installation, so for whatever you need it. These are called handlers in RAUC. And if that should be required for some reason, we also have the ability to fully replace the default installation handling, so all, everything what I talked about with slots and just use RAUC uh, as um, a container, a signed container, and um, then f do full custom handling inside routes. So these are the very basics. Now I want to dive a bit in some uh, details and some points that often come up or some new features that are in RAUC. So one of the questions that often come up is how does RAUC integrate or how does updating in general integrate with Verified Boot? And the good news is that it's mainly orthogonal to uh, updating. So if you have, for example, as here, um, a DM Verity approach, then the, uh, you have a hash tree, but this is generated offline on your host. So what you basically get to install then is uh, just an image and this boils down to yeah normal image uh, installation. And so, yeah, the update itself is not affected from this. If you have on the other side uh, something like DM integrity, then this won't work because uh, then you have the device mapper layer that calculates uh, the uh, tags in the journal and so on. And, but then you can use the uh, tar handling of RAUC because then the uh, kernel is, uh, is uh, installing the update or is copying the files and then it uh, yeah, generates these uh, required tags and so on during installation itself. So these are just uh, two examples. So uh, you don't need to care about verified boot for these scenarios. Um, these will, will perfectly integrate within an image-based or tar-based update system. So we've talked much about um, how to interact with the bootloader, but yeah, maybe 
you also want to update the bootloader. And updating the bootloader is always a critical operation because uh, the bootloader is the part of the system that does the switching. So for the bootloader, you don't have a fallback. And if you break your bootloader, you break your device. So uh, this is uh, often what people say, oh, I don't want to update my bootloader. It's too risky. It is risky. But what we can, we can at least achieve is uh, atomic updating of the bootloader. And uh, this is also supported by Rauk. Um, we have, um, at the moment, two cases where it's supported. It's a master boot record update that I will show. This is a general approach matching all devices. It's, uh, the second one is um, for EMMC. Um, this has to be supported by the bootloader, we will see. And uh, the other approaches that could be done but not yet implemented is uh, atomic update of the bootloader in NAND, uh, at least on the IMX6 platform. So uh, let's have a look how atomic bootloader updates for EMMC work. In, in EMMC, we have uh, two dedicated boot partitions, boot zero and boot one. These are outside of the normal user partitions. So uh, these are fully independent, also only in the EMMC standard, so an SD card doesn't have this. And then you have a register in your EMMC where you can say, okay, I want to boot either from the user partition that we won't care about, but we can either boot from the boot partition zero or from the boot partition one. And uh, the target device, or the ROM loader of the target device has to support reading this register, so it's not valid for all cases. Um, but if it does, then you can do, again, what I showed in the beginning. Uh, you have your bootloader currently running from this slot, and when you update your bootloader, you write it to the currently inactive slot. And if you're done and are sure that the update was successful, then you switch uh, the bit in the XCSD register, and then you are you're booting the next time from the boot zero slot. And this way, you can make your update atomic. And the same also works for a master boot record. And this is uh, luckily independent from uh, the actual loader, because it's implemented in the master boot record. So for devices that boot from the first petition of a master boot record, um, we have this support in RAUC, uh, where you can say, OK, uh, we have a redundant set of, or region defined for the first uh, petition. And um, in the, the uh, entry in the master boot record points to uh, one of these entries. And if we now want to install an update or a bootloader update, then Rauk writes to the uh, currently uh, shadow inactive um, petition, so or memory region, more or less. And if we're done writing this, then we simply uh, change the entry in the master boot record um, to point to this previously inactive region. And as the EMMC uh, bootloader support also before, this all boils down in Rauk to a simple boot type here. You just say, okay, my uh, slot type is boot MBR switch, and you say for which device, and the rest is uh, handled by Rauk automatically. So we implemented this as we uh, yeah, often run in cases where customers don't want to update the bootloader as it's tricky, and yeah, th these two uh, approaches give a good uh, a good argument for saying, okay, it's, it's still risky, but you have the chance to uh, update, or to perform the update at least atomic. And um, when it comes to network updates, uh, you typically run basically in constrained environments in two problems. You have an update that is too large, so if your uh, connection is a little slow, um, then uh, you have to transport a lot of data over the network. It would take much time and maybe also much money. And uh, you also need to have some temporary storage on your device where you uh, store the artifact before actually installing it. So what one actually wants for this is two things, streaming and data updates. And when we wanted to uh, support this in Rauk, there came up a tool called CAsync from the SystemD universe that uh, perfectly fits these use cases. And I shortly want to show 
how this is used in RAUC. So what uh, CAsync basically does is it uh, has a chunking algorithm that splits up a block device or a file system into uh, reproducible chunks of uh, similar size and creates an index from this. And uh, the index describes the order in which the chunks uh, should be uh, taken and installed to uh, gain the original image back. And uh, for RAUC, we change then the um, slot to not contain the actual image, but only uh, the index file, as you can see here. And then we have the uh, chunk store, so the individual chunks compressed somewhere on the server. And what RAUC then does for installing is uh, it runs the same algorithm on your currently active slot and calculates the chunks and stores references to these chunks. And this is called seeding, and it's called it in a seed store. These are basically siblings. And uh, when it should install the update on the target, uh, RAUC scans through this index files, or CAsync goes through this index files using uh, the seed store, and every uh, chunk that it can get from the seed store, so meaning that it can copy from the currently active petition, uh, it moves to uh, the currently inactive slot for updating. And only those uh, chunks that are not on the seed store need to be downloaded from uh, the chunk store. And this gives both streaming support and delta updaters. So this is very cool. So at, uh, to close this, just some final notes on how to integrate RAUG and uh, what it looks like when you actually use it. So um, it boils down to a very few components. Um, on the host side, you basically have this host tool, host tool for uh, generating the artifacts and some yeah, utilities like uh, MK SquashFS for generating the SquashFS. And on the target side, you need to install the service. And uh, yeah, the most important point is the system configuration that uh, says, OK, where is the key ring? Where are the slots? And so everything. And uh, then you need um, the crypto components. So on the target, you need a key ring so that Rauk knows uh, with uh, which key to uh, verify against. And for signing the update on the host system, you have a key pair uh, consisting of the private key and the certificate. And on the target, you also need the um, utilities like, I said, MK, MK uh, UBFS or um, utilities for uh, writing images to none, depending on what your actual setup is. Um, so uh, this is all that is basically required. And the rest is only configuration in the system config. So if you want to use it in your system, we have uh, support for um, the most common Linux build systems like Yocto, that we have uh, MetaLayer, MetaRauk, where uh, Rauk is supported. We have uh, built-in support for PDXs and also basic support in build root. And uh, for interfacing, with uh, an application, there's this DBus interface that allows, for example, triggering updates, but also allows to gain status updates so from the system, uh, progress information during the update. So everything you need to show it in your custom user interface. And there also is an example project uh, where you can see how this could work. This is called RAW Cockpit, what it basically does and you can also see it as a technical showcase uh, later this day. It's uh, on the one side, it interfaces via the uh, RAUC DBus API and uh, cares for updating here and uh, gets the status and uh, everything from RAUC. And on the other side, over network, it interfaces with Hawkbit, which is a, a deployment server, one of a few open source implementation of deployment servers we have. And uh, yeah, then it steadily pulls at the Hawkpit and asks for uh, an update. And if Hawkpit says, OK, there's an update, then uh, Rauk Hawkpit notifies Rauk to install the update. And yeah, this is basically a Python script. There's also a C implementation, but not yet part of the Rauk organization. So yeah, this is basically gives a rough overview of uh, what you need when uh, using Rauk for your target. So. This is all. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, if I have time left, I'm not sure. Uh, you may uh, have some questions, ask some questions. Or 
you can come later to us at the uh, technical showcase also and discuss with us if you have more in-depth questions. So thank you, first of all. Yes, do you need the microphone? Thanks. Um, there is uh, still a, a thing not very clear for me. Is Rogue a daemon or a program you have to invoke by yourself or composing it with uh, your scripts? Um, we are basically uh, a team. So Pangotronics is uh, the company, and uh, Rogue is one of the projects that we support. And uh, I am the co-maintainer. Uh, the maintainer also sits here, and um, yeah, they are parts of our company that are involved with, but there are also many outside contributors um, that are involved in the project. Ooh, hi. Actually, my question was, uh, does Rogue run as a daemon, or do you have to uh, call it uh, when you, you want to install an update? Um, then I got your question wrong, sorry. Um, Rauk uh, runs under, as a daemon on your device, so uh, normally it's... Um, not running necessarily running all the time. Uh, it can be activated via debus activation, so uh, that it all only um, starts when you start an installation. But yeah, normally when you don't install anything, then there's nothing much to do for Rauk. But you can potentially run uh, as a service infinitely on your target here. So that's all. Yes, yeah, a question. Can you have the micro or I? Yeah. Thanks. Do you handle in any way migrations? And when I'm asking that, how do you handle migrations in terms of where they run on the new operating system, on the old operating system, stuff like that? I, I know you have hooks, but I, as I assume all those run in the old environment. Basically. So you're talking about migration of data or? Of, yeah. Basically, let's, let's consider it as so, data. So the idea of image-based updating basically is to uh, exchange the entire system in a uh, defined state, so it's the very state you, that you tested. So there's no migration in the application part. But um, yeah, the migration of data is sometimes required, uh, mainly if you have, for example, um, uh, redundant data slots or something like this, and you move have to move the data from A to B. But um, your yeah, data is mainly depending on your application. So we plan to uh, support basic migration of just copying data from A to B that could be supported by Rauk. But if you have to migrate data uh, to a different format or something like this, this is something that is very application specific. So this would be something you have to handle in your application. So this is not the task of an update. Well, it can't be solved in a generic way. OK. So just to make sure I understood, the hooks in your case, the yes. one that you mentioned, they run on, in the environment of the old operating system, on the active operating system, right? Yes. Right. But you can install to the inactive system with them, so. You can use it for migration if that's a question. Um, it's probably half of a question, half of an answer. Uh, yes. We, maybe, when I understood it correctly, we had a, a similar problem in pass two where we had a in the field system which runs on a Debian based um, operating system and we wanted to replace by a Yocto operating system. And the solution was, well, booting from a USB stick and have the updater on the USB stick. Is this probably something supported by Rauk? We have an updater of the USB stick which updates the EMC in the in the disk with the image deployed on the USB stick. So it depends on what you mean by m updating. So it's not for replacing um, the partition table or something like this. So if you want to change the partitioning, that is something that is not a task of Rauk. So Rauk only installs file system images to in existing partitions. And if you want to migrate from a Debian system, um, then you either need to use the update uh, mechanism that is already in the system or 
install RAUC uh, into your Debian system and let it handle the replacement. So RAUC basically is independent from what kind of Linux distribution or something like this you use, but you always in, uh, replace the uh, only the uh, root file system, application file system, and so on, but you don't do any repartitioning. So it's not possible to repartition uh, a memory, a flash memory using RAUC as an infrastructure? No. Okay. This, is, this is not what it's intended for. So, anything else? Otherwise, I would again say thank you to everyone for attending this. And uh, yes, have a good day and many interesting talks at the next days of the conference.